Hello everyone, welcome to UMD Media, uh, UMD Media's show on the Horn Peace and Conflict Thermometer that is aired every other Sunday, it is now live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, as well as on satellite. Uh, we are, uh, our viewers in the Horn of Africa can view us on satellite as well under Horn Broadcasting Services. It's uh, an umbrella of a uh, number of media outlets, including the MD Media. Uh, so we are happy to be on your satellite as well. Today, uh, Professor Shuttle is back again with the Horn Africa Peace and Conflict Tormentor. Uh, Shuttle, uh, welcome back again to the third episode of the show. Thank you so much, Ketachu. Happy to be here with you. Great. Uh, so as usual, or at least we have run it for uh, two episodes in the past. What we'll do is we will start what uh, are the highlights for a shuttle in terms of uh, the past two weeks or since the last episode. And then we will uh, run through the number of questions we received from our viewers. Our viewers who sent us questions through uh, Twitter, Facebook, email, we thank you very much. And we want to you to actively participate in sending questions and uh, and Professor Combo will be happy to answer them um, on the, in the coming episode. So, Shetel, what's the highlight for you in terms of the Horn in general over the past week or uh, two weeks since our last episode? Well, it is a lot of events which are taking place. So obviously, we don't have time to um, to cover them all, but certainly the most shocking and the most um, dire events we have seen over the last couple of weeks are the indiscriminate massacres and killings of civilians in uh, West Oromia in Volga in particular and uh, the majorities of these civilians are of Amhara descent and there are several hundreds of people young children women and men who have been killed by armed groups and uh, this has of course created an outcry in ethiopia but it is also drawing international attention to the dire security situation ethiopia is under the fact that the federal government or the regional governments are not capable or capacitated or possibly even at times not interested in calming and arresting this um, spiral of violence, which we do see in parts of the country. So the killings over the last two weeks, it has been several episodes, but particularly in Gimbi and Kelevolga, um, has been a shock where several hundred civilians have been slaughtered. And the federal government and Prime Minister Abi, Abi, Abi Ahmed blames uh, Shene, ULA, Urumu Liberation Army, for these events. And in a recent speech in the House of Representatives, Abi Ahmed said, and I quote, Shene, ULA, is the arch enemy of the Urumu. Shene is a beast who has no mercy for anyone. It needs a study why they become a beast but they have no political purpose. Shene's goal is to destroy the country, and Shene is not the representative of the Rumo people, but its arch enemy. And he added, we will er eradicate it. The, in the same speech, so to say, uh, many viewed Abi Ahmed's um, relativization of the massacres, you know, equating it and don't playing the seriousness of it by comparing it to the civilian 
gun violence in the United States of America, where tens of thousands of people are killed every year, every year and uh, kind of excusing himself by saying that it's, you know, this is kind of natural and, uh, and it happens even in the US. I think that is a, that, that is a very false um, equation. And, um, and uh, maybe it was said uh, without any deeper thought behind it, but I think the prime minister should be very careful with, uh, with um, don't playing the seriousness of these very, very dire massacres hitting civilians and particularly then the Amhara, the Amhara people in, in Wolga the last couple of weeks. It has to be added that OLA and Jal Maru, uh, the chief commander of the Oromo Liberation Army Forces, have denied any responsibility of these massacres. OLA claim it is perpetrated by a militia which is sponsored by federal or regional authorities to do these acts and then later blame it on OLA. And uh, actually, quite of a surprise to many, a uh, Prosperity Party member of parliament representing East Hararge in Oromia, Angasha Ahmed Ibrahim, he supported uh, in a Facebook statement, he supported ULA's claim. And he, as a member of the government party, stated that these massacres were planned and orchestrated by the president of Oromia Regional State and the Prosperity Party's regional leadership. This is a, this was a, you know quite shocking that that this statement came from a, a cadre of the government party itself. It indicates obviously the the fractionizing within the prosperity party that you have a federal level leadership, but you also have a regional level leadership, and they are not always on the same page. Clearly, we have seen that on earlier occasions, and it might be also uh, the same we are witnessing now. If there are any truth into these accusations raised by the Prosperity Party member, I'm not saying that. I'm 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 keeping a neutral stand on who is to blame here. Uh, these killings have naturally sparked an outcry, particularly from Amhara representative organizations in Ethiopia and also in diaspora, um, that they call for accountability and investigations into them. Even AU has called for an uh, investigation into these massacres. Uh, also, the Ethiopian uh, House of Representatives passed recently a resolution to establish a special committee to investigate it. And also, has to be added, ULA itself has called for an independent investigation into the killings. So here we are, all potential suspects of these massacres are blaming each other for, for the killings. And uh, none of these actors, none of these belligerent actors can be trusted on face value. Not the Ethiopian government, not the regional authorities in the Rumia region, not OLA and any other. So to come to the bottom of, uh, of these uh, atrocities, in my view, the only solution will be an independent international based investigation into their facts on the ground. Um, however, it is highly unlikely that the federal authorities or the regional authorities will um, accept such a mechanism um, to work independently from the authorities. These, these recent massacres over the last two weeks are not any new, you know, these is uh, flaring up uh, both in uh, Wolga, in uh, West Oromia, in Benin Shangul Gumus, in Gambella, also in Amhara regional state against the Rumus. Um, they are perpetrated mostly against um, enclaves of, man, you know, what is called um, internal diaspora populations or spillover populations, um, which are particularly vulnerable in uh, the transition Ethiopia is undergoing, where, where federal or regional security or authorities are weakened and cannot be viewed uh, as independent of the conflicts in the country as such. They are part of it in many instances and possibly also driving it in certain contexts. 
And uh, minority populations are always the first to suffer in such dire circumstances. And I fear that we have not seen the last of these massacres, neither in uh, Oromia or in Amhara or in the other regional states. So it's a very sad development, which need to be obviously tried to address um, as soon as possible. We can add, uh, before we start with the questions, Gitachu, that uh, in the speech in parliament on the 7th of July, um, Abi Ahmed also mentioned a couple of other interesting elements. First, on the, on the Ethiopian constitution, he, um, he still has the position that the Ethiopian constitution is, under as it is today, uh, the valid instrument, uh, the supreme law of the country, but, uh, but also uh, open up for possible amendments of it, of certain sections of it. Uh, when it comes to the contested issues, then one might believe. Another issue he added uh, is also the issue of Wolkite and the status of Wolkite in West Tigray, which, as we know, have been claimed by force by Amhara regional state, um, taken away then and from the authority of Tigray regional state. And... Um, Abi Ahmed repeated his stand that the Volkite and the issue of Volkite needs to be sold um, according to the constitutional framework. Hence then rejecting the current position of Amhara Prosperity Party and the regional government of Amhara, which claims this is now Amhara territory, Amhara regional state territory, to use that term. So Events are unfolding every week in Ethiopia uh, and uh, we need to keep track uh, from day to day how this influences then both the overall context of conflict in the country but also then efforts of peace negotiations as such. Great, uh, thank you Shetel. I think um, some of this uh, will be maybe coming back to them uh, in the question and answer as well. So, Today, we receive a lot of questions, uh, and we have a number of them related to the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, Tigray Genocide, on the humanitarian situation, and uh, what is coming for Tigray in terms of the future, and on regional and international relationships. So, our viewer asked about a number of uh, questions related to what you think about TPLF in terms of, for example, the question goes, is the leadership in Tigray doing enough diplomatically and politically? And uh, the viewer compares to what has happened before uh, TDF returned from Deborah Brahan versus well, after that. And the viewer questions whether TPLF has learned a lesson and whether there is enough in terms of political space, uh, specifically in relation to the deciding the future of Tigray and so on. And the viewer also includes what the uh, diaspora uh, sphere is in terms of uh, what's happening within Tigray. Shato? Yes. These are, you know, and it was a couple of viewers who, who submitted these questions on the, on the kind of the internal dynamic in Tigray and the relationship between then the government of Tigray, uh, TPLF, uh, and the people of Tigray. And the whole that again relates to the ongoing political process uh, in relation to possible ceasefire negotiations and peace negotiations with the federal government of Ethiopia. Some of these, I should be careful, of course, to be too concrete because I'm not privy to the, uh, the dialogue between the government of Tigray and the federal government of Ethiopia. Uh, I don't know what they're talking about, how they're talking, who they're talking with, uh, and so on, not more than any other. Uh, but we can say something about the context um, in Tigray for the moment and the grievances raised by certainly as the viewer says 
by an increasing share of the Tigaru diaspora. But also, we saw a recent statement by the three opposition parties who participated in the regional elections in 2020. Um, Baitona, uh, the Tigray Independence Party, and Salsai Woyane, who issued a joint statement um, criticizing the lack of their involvement in governing affairs, so to say, in Tigray, and certainly relating to the peace process or negotiations. And in that regard, claimed that the government of Tigray when, or TPLF were not um, legally authorized to undertake the negotiations alone with the federal government of Ethiopia. I think we need to we need to keep some issues clear here. Uh, we're not. It is not TPLF who is negotiating with the federal government of Ethiopia. It's the regional government of Tigray who is a negotiating partner, if so, with the federal government of Ethiopia. And uh, the regional government of Tigray, yes, is constituted 100% by the TPLF officials. Uh, and they were elected in the regional elections organized in, in October, uh, September, October 2020. Um, and one in that. And I think from that status, I do believe that the regional government of Tigray is authorized to negotiate on behalf of the Tigrayan people with the federal government of Ethiopia. However, I think there are variant grounds for criticism on how this process is handled, in a sense. And this is an outsider's perspective and in a comparative perspective. Um, the, yes, the government of Tigray needs to keep certain issues confidential. Of course, they are at war. But other things doesn't need to be kept clandestine. <laughs> um, and um, there are several issues in this regard in... Um, lack of efficiency, lack of transparency, lack of consistent communication from the government of Tigray, both to its own people in Tigray, but certainly towards the international community, which can be criticized. Um, a government at war needs to prioritize its efforts. Yes, obviously it does. But that the TPLF is still very much operating on a need to know basis, as they more or less always have done. It is a very clandestine, convoluted organization. Um, but you don't need to communicate, need to know only on all aspects of the process Tigray is undergoing. And certainly, if you want to attract international attention, international sympathy, international solidarity, and international support for the efforts Tigray is trying to gather, I would say, and I would strongly recommend, a different kind of communication strategy from the regional government of Tigray. You can view it in comparison, for instance, with what's happening in Ukraine these days and President Zelensky's uh, communication strategy, where he is every day communicating both to his own people and base through Twitter, through Internet, to YouTube, through Facebook, but also to the international audience, updating everyone on uh, the war, the humanitarian situation, the dire stress the Ukraine people are put under by the aggression of Russia, and so on. And we hardly see that from the regional government of Tigray, or from President de Brezion, speaking directly to an international audience, speaking directly to gather sympathy, disclosing the humanitarian catastrophe in Tigray. It is first now when the foreign media outlet managed to access Tigray, a French company, where we have footage, where we have films, where we have where we can see the dire humanitarian situation in Tigray with their own eyes. So I think I think that is uh, something I hope the Tigrayan government should take on board as a constructive criticism that they need to change that kind of messaging. They need to, in order to maintain in order to maintain the full support they do have, or the, maintain the support they do have in their endeavors to, to try to bring peace and to try to bring 
developments uh, to Tigray and to try to settle these issues. And in that space, in that context, I would also recommend them, yes, to be open towards the Tigrayan opposition parties who were crucial in contributing to the regional elections in 2020, but certainly also are crucial in contributing to the struggle today. And the key issue here is also that the TDF, the Tigrayan army or the Tigrayan defense forces are not a TPLF army as they were during the 17 years of the struggle. The TDF today is a Tigrayan all-encompassing army reflecting all political opinions and aspirations of the Tigrayan people. And hence, it might be of relevance then to include other political aspects into um, the governing halls or Mekile, so to say. So there are uh, elements of criticism I think is valid. Uh, but of course, I also appreciate the fact that it is a nation at war and uh, a nation at war can never be democratic <laughs> because you need to have a strict line of authority, a line of command, which uh, you don't put out uh, military dispositions on the, on the vote. That has to be decided through other mechanisms. But when it comes to when it comes to the humanitarian issues, when it comes to negotiations and so on, and moving forward, we will come back to that. I think it is important to um, to include uh, um, um, possibly some broader voices into that process. And uh, you can say some of these questions, you know, why isn't TPLF taking lessons from its failure? I don't know what uh, this viewer uh, uh, implies with, with failure. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, and uh, a follow-up question, as you read, if it continues with the current path, do you fear that the diaspora might start abandoning TPLF and mass? I don't necessarily think so, because, again, there are no alternatives in Tigray to TPLF when it comes to governing capacity and, and strategy. And so I think uh, still the support to Tigray, to TPLF will be there. But I do like to mention, I remember quite vividly when I was in Tigray during the elections in 2020, more or less all, well, the many, many people I spoke to in Mekile and elsewhere in the region said that, you know, as we are entering a phase of war and instability, we need to put our trust and support behind TPLF. But uh, hence, we vote for TPLF in the election. But if it had been a peaceful scenario, a peaceful future for Tigray, we will have voted differently. And we will vote differently once Tigray has achieved peace again or independence again. Uh, so TPLF shouldn't take in, should not take the absolute support of the Tigrayan, absolute political support of the Tigrayan people for granted. They should be more humble towards opinions of the populace and of the electorate. Hmm. One thing, uh, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that last part, uh, your experience in Tigray during the election. Uh, the one argument the opposition and others outside the opposition in Tigray mentioned is TPLF, yes, it's elected legally, uh, but as Gita Chorada reportedly said it was a protest vote like you are also mentioning uh, but now what in the negotiation that will decide essentially the future of Tigray uh, this this needs a constitutive vote not a protest vote mm. so that's you know the argument people are uh, putting on the table saying uh, yes you can you know to some extent argue legally it's a legally elected legitimate government, but mm. for a different purpose. Uh, so what, what is your uh, point on that yet? No, and, and, and that's, that's a key concern here, also raised by the Tigrayan opposition parties that, um, that they are afraid that 
with only TPLF at the negotiation table trying to hammer out a peace agreement, the voices which advocate a different view of Tigray, a different view of the status of Tigray within the Ethiopian Federation, for instance, and other issues, are not present and hence will not be taken into account when an agreement is signed off. And I can see that point. That's a, that is a valid concern by those parties or those constituencies in Tigray that um, because TPLF, well, the obvious issue is the status of Tigray as such, as part of Ethiopian Federation or as an independent entity. Uh, we have heard repeatedly during the war that uh, the Brezion has said that that issue should be put out for referendum for the Tigrayan people to decide directly. But then, will there be a referendum or, you know, a state, the status of Tigray and a possible referendum will obviously be part of the negotiation if it comes to a peace agreement. And uh, I think that's the, the key issue for many Tigrayans, that can we trust TPLF to remain steadfast on that issue, to insist on the fact that we want a referendum, or will they accept some other deal in order to create a peace process? So, and, and uh, the government in elections in 2020, or the elections in 2020, was an election to prepare for war, to prepare for collective security. It wasn't an election deciding more the, the, the end game, so to say, the future of Tigray as such, because it was a very tense context, obviously, in September, October 2020. So yes, we, we are coming a bit back to that later when it comes to the status of Tigray, so we can pick it up again then maybe get out of it. Great, yeah, makes sense. So the uh, maybe from the same viewer, the question on mm -hmm. Tigray genocide. So again, questioning whether the Tigray leadership is uh, doing enough, and also you know your uh, view on what could be done more. And uh, the viewer is connecting the dots here in relation to what happened, maybe might have happened elsewhere. Well, from world history. <laughs> Uh, country committing genocide on its own people and how peace could be, you know, uh, regained uh, in terms of the genocider mm. and also the uh, victims. Mm. Yeah, and this is this is obviously a, an extremely difficult um, and and um, dire question and and problem complex. Most of the genocides haven't taken place in the world, or at re recent in modern history, has ended with either, you know, that people have been killed off, and that's it, or that you have had a counter resistance leading to a change of government in that specific geographical context, leading to a process of accountability for the atrocities having taken place. It can be like in Rwanda genocide, where it was both a domestic process of legal accountability and also an international ad hoc tribunal in order to take the key political leadership and make them accountable. Uh, in uh, Cambodia, after the Khmer Rouge, um, in the former Yugoslavia, you had an international tribunal. Um, so, that is the kind of the normal <laughs> in the sense that either the government who are committing perpetrating the genocide continues in, in in power and nothing no accountability happens or that you have a change of government and an accountability process is is established be that a domestic or an international accountability process in ethiopia when the fall of the Derg in 1991, the EPRDF put in place the Red Terror Trial, so-called, and made um, both political and military leadership uh, for the Red Terror accountable through a legal mechanism. What will happen in uh, when it comes to the accusations of genocide in Tigray? It's still, it's still not 
you know, legally confirmed that the genocide is taking place. But in my view, you can argue that. Uh, how that will be handled, how that will be processed. Well, it all depends on the outcome of the war itself today or the outcome of a possible peace process. If, as it is um, possible, what we see today, that the Addis Ababa and Mekele have an interest to settle the war through a negotiation mechanism, yes, Accountability has been a precondition by TPLF to enter such a process. Accountability for the atrocities taking place in Tigray. Accountability versus Eritrean forces, versus Amhara forces, and versus Ethiopian forces. But from a realistic viewpoint, there is hardly, I, don't, I cannot think of any um, case where the political leadership being blamed for the atrocities accepts voluntarily to be placed under juridical accountability mechanisms directly. So that will be one of the issues which will probably be toned down or will be negotiated to an outcome where the accountability will be pushed down. As Ethiopia has started today, as the Minister of Justice, uh, Gedeon, has ordered the prosecution to start uh, investigating uh, war crimes, but those investigations, as far as we know, are only aimed at rank-and-file soldiers and lower-level officers. It doesn't hit the general, you know, the, the leadership in the military. And certainly it is not involved yet any kind of political leadership. So a potential outcome of this will be that, yes, you have a peace agreement which says, yes, we will have accountability, but that accountability will be pushed downwards, down the ranks, and you will have some junior officers and uh, rank and file soldiers put to court for what happened in Tigray. And the political leadership and the military leadership will, will, will not be part of that. I think that is the most likely outcome if we come to a peace negotiation. So the question, are the Tigray leadership doing enough in terms of the genocide in Tigray? I think they're doing absolutely what they can to stop it. Well, it is, it has partly stopped now, with a, but, but, but you do have... Uh, reports of, of dire events in, in West Tigray and also Tigrayans elsewhere in Ethiopia, but the active genocide inside Tigray Central has, has stopped, as we know. Um, but again, this is this is more or less, uh, 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 you know, this is, a, this is a dilemma which always occurs in these kind of transitions, uh, peace or justice dilemma, it is called. If you're going to have peace, you will not have justice when it comes to putting the perpetrators to account. Yeah, I think we will come to that uh, aspect of uh, accountability as well, uh, maybe in the next question. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to share. Yeah, so the humanitarian and uh, negotiations. So this mm. is a from our audience again about why is basic humanitarian aid food medicine used as a precondition many were hoping you know this would be uh, a non-starter in terms of uh, you know uh, allowing that and so on so uh, the the man made army in Tigray, uh, all that and then is seeking advisors legal or diplomatic, mm. political from its own people, Tagars. I think it's related to what we said before, but including uh, foreign advisors. So what is your take mm. and what's the advantage? Well, when it comes to the humanitarian situation, we know that, uh, first of all, in under international humanitarian law, which is the legal paradigm 
uh, ruling now the situation in Tigray and in Ethiopia to a large degree. Humanitarian aid and access to the civilian population are not up for negotiations. That's exactly what the international humanitarian law regulates, that the civilian population in the conflict zone should not be affected by the warring parties directly, and uh, humanitarian action should be unimpeded, unfettered throughout uh, um, a country at war. So obviously from day one, uh, the federal government of Ethiopia has breached international humanitarian law by restricting or barring access, humanitarian access to Tigray. There's no doubt about that. And then we need to add over the last three months, we have seen an increase of humanitarian aid flowing into it to Tigray, which is very positive, and certainly over the last month, an in increasing day by day increase of shipment. Uh, of, uh, of humanitarian aid. What is lacking, however, is um, an in but still, as the last numbers I saw from OCHA, UN OCHA office, says that over the last three months, about 20% of the needs have been shipped in. So we haven't reached any kind of full level. 20% maximum of the needs in Tigray have been transported in over the last three months. But what is lacking is fuel, fuel to transport the humanitarian aid from Mekele and to distribute it across the region. Because the federal government doesn't accept the sufficient level of fuel trucks to go to Tigray because they are afraid that that fuel will be used for military purposes, probably. So it is a backlog. <laughs> of humanitarian aid, how it should be distributed out to the people in need across the region. And keep in mind that the distribution here is taken care of by the UN and international humanitarian actors. It's not the responsibility, you can say, of the government of Tigray. So the pretext to hold back fuel by the federal government is um, also a statement saying that the federal government doesn't trust UN doesn't trust international humanitarian actors because they have the responsibility to distribute this um, uh, the humanitarian aid and they are not given sufficient level of fuel to do that. Or money or other kind of resources too are held back. So um, there is still a lot to do when it comes to mobilizing for unfettered, unimpeded humanitarian access to Tigray and to the famine-struck population of the country, which we know are dying by the day. We saw that, as again mentioned on this recent French documentary from the region. Um, and uh, I think it is still very relevant and necessary for the Tigaru in diaspora to mobilize, to pressure their governments, wherever they are, in Norway, in Scandinavia, in the US, in Canada, to put pressure again on the Ethiopian government to really open up and, uh, and um, unimpeded access to, to the famine-struck population. And also to prepare for the upcoming harvest season with fertilizers, uh, agricultural equipment which have been destroyed in the war, and so on and so forth. Not only the, the humanitarian aid as such. So the second part of that question then um, is, uh, as you said, uh, the seeking advices, both legal, diplomatic and political from its own people and the foreign advisors. Um, is that uh, possible and it is feasible? And what are the advantages? I, I assume that relates both to the humanitarian situation, but certainly to the, to the peace process and peace negotiations to come. I do think, uh, as far as I know, uh, the Tigrayan government are receiving a lot of input, uh, both kind of formally structured and informally channeled from the Tigaru in diaspora. And you have the, um, uh, the Tigrayan professional societies, uh, scholars are, are helping uh, and, and other capacities are helping with advice, with policy deliberations, with analysis. Uh, the academic community in Tigray is certainly also providing a lot of input. We see that um, all the four universities of Tigray are helping the government in order to 
have a better robust empirically underpinned um, policy um, when it moves forward in terms of both the humanitarian situation but also other aspects. And so certainly that is possible and feasible. And also I think it might be an advantage, at least when it comes to um, to the political diplomatic aspects, that the also government might uh, uh, relay on international capacities to give advice on um, both um, how the world views Ethiopia and uh, the situation in Tigray and the co conflicts in Ethiopia, but also the concrete aspects of negotiations as such. But we have to keep in mind that the, the TPLF leadership and the current government of Tigray, they do have a very broad and long experience in uh, both ruling a country, Ethiopia, and also in international relations. So I, I'm sure they do have uh, all what they need of knowledge and capacities at home. But it's never the, you know, it's, it doesn't hurt also to bring on some new perspectives in, in this regard. So, and, and I'm sure they, they are entertaining that idea. Uh, in fact, uh, on that last point, some are saying when it comes to negotiation, yes, they might have uh, all kinds of experience and uh, results to show in terms of, uh, you know, winning battles, war, all that, but maybe not as much as colorful when it comes to negotiating. Uh, is that uh, something that you can uh, agree to or? Um... Possibly, yes, in the sense that TPLF has never been so inclined to negotiate anything <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to political processes or military processes. Uh, and we do see if we those who remember the negotiations after the 1998 2000 war with Eritrea, where where the EPRDF TPLF government at that time, I have to say, Uh, I will be careful with my words, but it was obvious that they didn't really understand the framework of the negotiations or the substance of its outcome when it comes to the disputed area of Badma, for instance. So, yes, I do think when it comes to the concrete processes of negotiations, they would need help or they, they should at least accept or look into the possibility to bring on board uh, some internationals uh, or environments who do have that competence, who do have that experience, who are more uh, skilled in, in those strategies than um, TPLF presumably are. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, on the fate of Tugrai, the future of Tugrai, we received a number of questions. Uh, some of them are uh, specific with, uh, for example, what Jawar reportedly said to, to grand activists in private meeting, but also on the general uh, aspect of um, what would be the consequence mm. or uh, hurdles mm. for Tigray seeking independence. Mm. Uh, and then there is even the bigger reconfiguration of Horn of Africa in general and what your mm. perspective on that. Mm. Yes, and this is this is uh, extremely complex, obviously. And um, first of all, when it comes to can Tigray become an independent state, and what are the obstacles to that? We know, I think, quite clearly that if it is a referendum tomorrow on the status of Tigray, my bet, at least, my analysis is that the majority of the Tigrayan people will vote yes for independence for Tigray. Because the collective and individual security are so threatened by Ethiopia and Ethiopian actors. And in order to mitigate or elevate that, you need security guarantees that no one can provide. So the only option possibly felt by the majority of the Tigaru is to become independent, to take care of their own business, no matter what. That again, that sentiment might change going forward, but I think that at least is the, is the mainstream sentiment today. But 
we know that sovereignty and internationally recognized sovereignty is not depending upon what the people of that geographical area want. It depends upon recognition by other states, by other internationally recognized sovereign state. Sovereignty is given by others. It's not obtained by the people as such in the international order of today. The best example of that is Somaliland, which have been a independent ruled country for decades, but which are not internationally recognized as a sovereign state. So, and that's the dilemma of Tigray, that for Tigray to become internationally recognized as a sovereign state, the first and key obstacle to that is then to get an agreement and understanding with the Addis Ababa regime, with rest Ethiopia, to accept it. As we saw in Arit when it comes to the Eritrean independence in 1993, that Ethiopia accepted the issue of referendum on the status of Eritrea and Ethiopia were the first country to recognize Eritrea's sovereignty after the referendum of 24th of May 1993. And after that, other countries followed. And the same situation will be versus Tigray. Ethiopia owns Tigrayan sovereignty today. Tigrayan sovereignty is under Ethiopia. For Tigray to achieve internationally recognized sovereignty, it means that Ethiopia needs to grant it to them first through a legal process of a referendum. The Ethiopian constitution allows for that, but the Ethiopian constitution is just a piece of paper. It's not implemented. So it is up to the government in Addis and what they believe should be the best outcome of this. And that's a, that's a sticky point. The people of Tigray can vote 10 times for independence. And yes, you might manage to defend your borders and become a de facto state as Somalia land, Somaliland. But that is no guarantee for international recognition and sovereignty. So you might have a situation so I think that's what's holding back TPLF to go all in for a sovereignty issue. Although they have said that we want a referendum. But they are a bit, you know, ambiguous on that issue. <laughs> um, because they are afraid that it will not be internationally recognized. And that, hence, then, it will be uh, an impediment for the development of Tigray economically, socially, internationally if you don't have that status. And I think if, if Tigray goes towards a referendum and the vote in the referendum is yes to independence and you have a government in Mekele which declares unilateral independence for the Republic of Tigray and Ethiopia rejects to recognize it, you can either have no recognition at all or you can, something we will come back to briefly at the end, because of the geopolitical play in the Horn of Africa, some states might be interested to give recognition to the Tigray independence in order to use Tigray as a pawn in their own geopolitical play in the Horn. And then you have a certain bloc recognizing Tigray, others don't. You know, Kosovo in the former Yugoslavia, the Kosovo Republic, is recognized by most Western states, but is not recognized by Russia and and their allies, for instance. So that is also creating a dilemma. That then, if you get recognition from Egypt, for instance, because Egypt wants to use Tigray in order to, for their own benefit versus the Gur Dam or whatever, uh, it's not necessarily that constructive for Tigray, because then Tigray is directly linked to an Egypt agenda. And other states, again, will be hesitant to recognize Tigray because they don't want to be looked upon as allies with Egypt. So that, that is a very complicated political situation. 
which obviously needs to be taken into account before a referendum in order to to create mechanism which safeguards these kind of uh, unwanted situations for the people of Tigray. So I, I, it is not that easy. It's not black and white, either part of the Ethiopian Federation or a sovereign country. No, it is not, sadly. And that's possibly what uh, Jawar hints to in this uh, quote from one of our viewers. I don't know if that is a reliable quote. I don't know the person who has submitted that uh, that uh, question, but he alludes to that in a private meeting with Tigrayan activists, rep uh, Jawar reportedly said, warned that you should not insist on the referendum and on accountability for the, for the war crimes and atrocities committed in Tigray. Possibly he have done that, and that's then out from the view that he knows that these two issues are the most difficult issues for the Ethiopian government to accept. <laughs> that's it. And why insist on something which cannot be carried out, carried through? Because that just blocks then the possibilities for negotiations. You shouldn't put up preconditions which are 100% preconditions because then negotiations won't start. One should put up, these are the issues we need to discuss. These are the issues we need to negotiate. Tigray status, accountability status, and so on. Not say that this is an absolute precondition. We will not go forward for anything before you accept accountability. Then it is non-negotiation. So it's possibly, if Javar has said that, it's possibly in that context uh, that he can see, as he has better understanding possibly of what Abe thinks and the prosperity party means on these issues. Mm. Maybe related to that, uh, Shetel, so isn't it on uh, the TPLF or the government of Tugai should at least either way, either way, you know, be clear and say for this or whatever reason they might have, they say we are not going to go for referendum or even independence uh, versus, you know, we are for that. Because everything else in terms of international recognition, you know, all that I think comes from pronouncing that, isn't it? Yes, but I can also see the difficulties of the government of Tigray to come out now, particularly since they have repeatedly said during the last year, that we will have a referendum. <laughs> so they, they, it's difficult for them now to say, no, we cannot have a referendum. But you can communicate, for instance, that, you know, it is not, this is a long-term process. Ethiopia is undergoing a transition. Tigray is undergoing a transition, a transition which will continue, political transition which will continue probably for five to 10 to 15 years. It will not be solved tomorrow or next year. So as part of any process of negotiation, you can say, yes, we will have a referendum, but that referendum might take place in 2030. Because until then, we need to see how the situation stabilizes. We will have security guarantees for our individual and collective security. We will have reparations of lost property. We will have uh, compensation for the damages in Tigray and so on, all the way stacked up until 2030. And in 2030, you will have a new government in Ethiopia, inshallah. Um, and the situation might be very different than today. So you don't necessarily take a vote on independence in the midst of war. Because the sentiments are uh, not, uh, if I may use that term, if, with, with, mod with, with modesty. It's not, um, it's not politically, rationally calculated outcome. Because you don't see, you only see the war and you only see the suffering. And that's then it's a natural reaction to say that we want to get out of this. And that's the extreme outcome, independence. You don't see the economical, social, international relations obstacles to that option. So if you have a period of uh, a transitional period of 10 years, for instance, in Eritrea in 1991, they defined two years transitional period before the referendum. They didn't conduct a referendum in June 1991, as they could have done. They waited two years. Of course, the Eritrean referendum was a, 
most of a, a, a pre-decided solution anyway so it is not directly comparable but i think it is wise to decide some kind of transitional period be that three years five years ten years in order to see how ethiopia evolves into a different ethiopia which possibly could accommodate tigray which possibly could provide security guarantees not only for Tigaru but for all ethiopian people mm. if you are very optimistic so I think uh, the Tigrayan government should start to signal somehow to its people that the negotiation outcome is not black and white from day one the negotiation is signed off, the agreement is signed off. It is a transitional period ahead of us. We are not sure what that transition will involve or how long it will take, but you need to be prepared that not everything is sold immediately after we signed off a succession of hostilities agreement or a peace agreement. Mm. And that's part of, again, as the first part we discussed, the lack of communication, mm. the, the, which, is, which, is, which is, you know, uh, fostering any, all kinds of rumors and speculations and conspiracy theories and, and opposition. Because people are insecure, people are uncertain, people are desperate in order to seek some kind of uh, where is my future? Where is the future for my family? Where are we heading individually, collectively, as a nation? We need to know because otherwise, well, we go, we seek refuge somewhere else. So it, it's 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 a crucial period where the communication strategy should be really ramped up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Shetel, uh, this subject matter, uh, I think, deserves own show i mean learning from lessons elsewhere the mechanics the mm -hmm. dynamics all this social humanitarian uh, political all that and uh, so we'll come back hopefully if it works for you in a separate show uh, let's mm -hmm. go to the last section of the today's uh, mm -hmm. thermometer so this is on regional and uh, international relations and uh, i was just checking uh, for an update uh, from uh, Asmara. So what we know now is, uh, uh, in fact, it's interesting. Uh, I want, I can't wait to hear your perspective on that. With the Somalia uh, president in Asmara, uh, just uh, half an hour ago, uh, there is a report uh, from Hawalti uh, or Yemeni government. Uh, this is not the ma Yemen monkey. The, this is Yemen. Uh, what is another name, right? Nickname? Uh, who is Yemen? I don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, then, yeah, so, not the uh, Yemen Gebra. Not, uh, not the monkey. No, that's yeah. true. <laughs> Yemen uh, Gebra. So he's saying that uh, the president of Somalia today, with Isaiah Saforki, actually. Toured, uh, uh, he visited or inspected part of the members of the Somali National Army who received three year military training in Eritrea. Um, let me just uh, maybe make it bigger for our viewers to see this on the screen. So, one uh, question we received. Uh, just when the uh, announcement of this four-day visit was announced, uh, what, uh, what is your take on what might be uh, being implied in this visit uh, and so on? But now, just half an hour ago, Yamana mm. reported that this uh, three years mm. of military training in Eritrea. Mm. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, and that, that was, of course, what has been um, speculated. It, it was part of that visit. And, and I think it is clearly, it's, you know, obviously three, it's three obvious reasons for, for such a visit. Uh, he is a new president uh, in the region, uh, President Hassan Mahmoud. Um, uh, one of the first obligations the president will have is to visit the relevant neighboring countries to establish new personal direct relations with the head of states surrounding him. So it is a courtesy call uh, to um, President Isaias of Eritrea. Um, the second uh, 
issue is obviously to um, revisit and possibly renegotiate bilateral agreements between Mogadishu and Asmara, um, and also the tripatriate agreement between Asmara, Addis, and uh, Mogadishu, entered into by his predecessor Formaggio, which kind of were part of the redesign of the Horn of Africa, so to say, uh, after the peace process between Abi and Isaias. And uh, because we assume that President Hassan has a different view and a different policy on, on some of these uh, issues which are regulated by the bilateral and tripatriate agreements. So it is natural for him to, to visit the stakeholders in these agreements uh, to present his views and possibly renegotiate them or revise the agreements. And then the third issue, which I've been speculated the mostly about, is to bring back the troops, to bring back the Somali troops, which have been in Eritrea for three years uh, and which were used as part of the war against Tigray. And it has been claimed that Isaias of Werke has kept these troops by force, so to say, that he has denied their return to Somalia. Uh, used them as a bargaining chip versus I don't know what kind of favor he wants out of uh, the new president or used it as a threat again against Tigray uh, as a military threat force. So it is very interesting to see that Yemane Gebremeskel, uh, who um, is now publicly announcing the kind of that these troops now finally have graduated from their three years of training uh, and active warfare in Tigray, and assumingly then will be brought back home to Somalia. Uh, that's, that's good to see, because I know there are hundreds of uh, parents in Somalia who are desperate to hear the news of their sons and uh, to see their return back home to safety, or relative safety. Hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, then related to that, uh, on Sudan, uh, Jason from Sudan uh, asked this question of uh, what your view is on the return of the military uh, to power uh, despite the continued protests and stability. And he's, still, uh, he's asking if uh, the Sudanese military supports the TPLF, would there be any potential support that might help them reclaim Western Tigray or topple Isaias? Mm. Um, and uh, he's talking about uh recognition that isaias is good at manipulating tribes in sudan and maybe could block mm. uh, the border from the sudan side yeah and this again we it is assumed that tplf does have very good contacts at the high level of the military in sudan uh, going way back and and that is put to use now as the situation is in Tigray and in Ethiopia. And uh, if you, what we didn't mention over the last, uh, you know, the, the flare up of the conflict in Al-Fashka between uh, triangle between Sudan and Ethiopia, which happened just a couple of weeks ago, where it was renewed fighting and, uh, and uh, a dozen or so Sudanese officers and soldiers were, were executed by Ethiopian people. We don't know if it is the regional forces or federal forces. Um, and Sudan then uh, started, um, you know, which, which was part of this uh, flare up of the border conflict. Ethiopia at that, or Ethiopian spokespersons at that time claimed that TPLF troops were fighting alongside Sudanese troops in Al Fashka. And um, again, that's not independently verified. We, we don't know for sure. But it is a link, and uh, and it is speculated, obviously, that uh, that uh, Sudan and Tigray will uh, coordinate their political interest and also military interest in order to um, secure Al Fashka and to secure uh, West Tigray for for uh, for the Tigrayan uh, government. Uh, Again, we I don't have any hard facts um, of the recent events to to verify that this is true, but it's one scenario at least we can see coming. 
And uh, yes, Isaias, <laughs> he is a... Uh, he is the chief manipulator, not only of the tribes in Sudan, in Western Sudan, but uh, all across the region, one can say, uh, the Horn of Africa. And um, he has played that card on and off uh, several times, how he is using uh, that as a threat to Khartoum, that he will instigate a civil war or instigate a, a rebellion in Kasala in, in, um, in East um, Sudan for his own purposes if Khartoum is not doing uh, according to his own interests. And we see the relationship between Khartoum and, and Asmara is, you know, is, is, is a bit meandering. Uh, but, um, and I think it is important, you know, and Khartoum certainly knows the potential of Isaias to create unrest in that part of Sudan and they would like to keep him at bay as long as possible. But, but if push comes to show, I don't think Isaias has the highest um, uh, reliability, to use that term, uh, in, in Khartoum. Great. Uh, so the last question is on, um, I, uh, it's a big question, uh, but uh, maybe you can address briefly, given the time we have. So mm. this is a question of who is really uh, the regional power in terms mm. of destabilizing or messing uh, with the Horn of Africa region and East Africa in general. It is, uh, the viewer asks us about UAE, Qatar, and Saudi. Yeah, it's, it's too big question to answer with the one, two minutes left for us now. But first of all, I think, I think one should be very careful to externalize the domestic conflicts and challenges Ethiopia are facing. Uh, the conflict drivers and the responsibility for the unrest we see in Ethiopia today are to be found in an Ethiopia and should be blamed on domestic actors and policies. That's my view. Yes, external elements are contributing to the conflict dynamics one way or another, but they are not there to be held to account for instigating it to start with. So, and I think you have an overlap of interest, obviously, between the Middle Eastern actors as outlined here, the Emirates, the Qatar, the Saudi, but these interests also change over time. And what these actors have been as, a, you know, the Middle Eastern actors have as their main uh, objective, you can say, is to have economic political influence in Ethiopia, in the region. Not necessarily a military role as such. And you see how, for instance, the Emirates have changed over the last two years by originally supporting, you know, helping Ethiopian federal government in the war on Tigray with the drone capacity, then pulling that back, then helping again with new arms shipment to Ethiopia, then suspending that, and now giving aid to Tigray and being part of a negotiation team trying to solve the crisis between Mekel and Addis. So it is not a constant. They are constantly revising and reviewing and reassessing the relationship to Ethiopia and Ethiopian actors according to what's happening on the on the ground. And then you have another set of internationals like Egypt, like Sudan, who have maybe much more concrete territorial objective like Sudan or resource objective like the Gerd Dam when it comes to both Sudan and, and, and Egypt or other more concrete military aspects of the relationship to Ethiopia. And possibly, again, we need independent verification, but they are at least accused on somehow fostering some of the conflict dynamics we see in West Ethiopia, in Gambella, Benin, Shangul, for instance, and, and, and West Oromia. So, yes, you do have international actors taking advantage of the domestic conflict dynamics in Ethiopia, but the domestic conflict dynamics in Ethiopia are home ground. 
they are the consequences of failed policies from the federal to the regional levels. Basically, that's it. And you haven't managed to put Ethiopia on a peaceful track yet for a stable transition towards a more all-inclusive and uh, stable democratic order. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Etel. Uh, I think uh, you, you excellently covered all the questions for you. So, viewers, uh, we will be back with the fourth episode in three weeks' time. That is the end of this month on the 31st of July. And if you have any question related to peace, conflict in the whole, uh, please send us uh, to our email address, umd dot media dot 2020 at gmail.com you can also reach us on twitter and facebook inbox us dm us and uh, we will uh, forward that to professor shelter from who is a peace and conflict expert a professor in oslo and uh, he has been very active over the last three decades in the horn of africa specifically in eritrea ethiopia and so on uh, Shetel, thanks for your time and uh, have a good evening from here. Thank you, Gitarjo. For you too. And to the listeners, thanks. Thanks. Bye. We were live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and on Sublight uh, in the Horn of Africa on, uh, under Horn Broadcasting Services on YASAT uh, Satellite. Thank you for your viewership and continue to contribute. Send your your questions, as I mentioned, by mail, uh, on DM, on inbox, on Facebook. And uh, on Sunday, I'll be back with, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday, actually, uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Niertra Zitaba, Politica Tigray, Bainer of Hatigray, Kari Nave, Miss Gita Chogora Kirosen, Sisai Tafalun. Uh, thank you for your uh, viewership have a good one